Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church of Hopkins, Michigan. Uh, welcome to those of you who are here present, on site, as well as those of you who are out there online. Today is a special day, and I'm not just talking about being the sixth Sunday after Easter. I'm referring to the national holiday that uh, people celebrate called Mother's Day. Unfortunately, Mother's Day is not a, a holiday or a high festival in our, our church pericope. It's not uh, part of the festival church here. Uh, although um, it, it should be, it can be if you really wanted to. Of course, then we have to make Father's Day as well, another one of those high festival days as well. But um, as you have heard me say before, and I'll say it a million more times, Mother's Day is every day. Father's Day is every day. The Lord has given each of us the privilege to have, to have families, and uh, it, it's a gift from Him. So every single day is a gift from Him, a gift to you moms, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, I don't know if there's any great great grandmother, but could be. So, um, but again, let's celebrate today, Easter six, Mother's Day. Um, we'll have a prayer for for your moms. Um, yeah, you need a lot of prayer for moms. So, just as dads do too, as well. So let's worship our Lord today, the Giver of everything that's good, every good gift. We will use service of the Word. You'll find it on page thirty-eight and following. Christian worship. We begin with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Each of us has had the privilege to be able to come into his, in the presence of God this morning, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we all know that we've disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, we need to confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Let's do that together. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. greatest message there is that you and I have heard with our ears and that we proclaim with our mouths is that God our Heavenly Father has forgiven all of our sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Savior Jesus Christ, He has removed your sin and its guilt from you forever. The result is that you are a perfect, blood-washed child of God. May God now give to each of us the strength to live according to His will. Amen. We bow our heads for the prayer of the day. Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us all to think those things that are true and long for those things that are good. That we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. We are at the top of page 40 in our worship agenda. One of the things that when we get back to normal is going to sort of hard having to do what we used to do, getting up, sitting down, getting up, sitting down again. So, um, so... I guess that's one of the things I'm not, not looking forward to June 6th, but again, we still can. Our first lesson, because it's the sixth Sunday after the festival of Easter, Christ is risen, he is risen, risen indeed, is taken from the book of Acts. The word of our Lord spreads after the first great persecution in Jerusalem. The church in Antioch experienced substantial growth, especially among the heathen and the Gentiles. Again, 
you and I recognize that persecution of people in the faith was something that was not good. But look at what the Lord did with that. That something that you and I didn't think was good, he turned out to be a blessing. Not only for the people that came to faith, but for his entire church. We turn our attention to Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, then from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Here ends our first lesson. Our worship continues in the book of the Psalms. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 98. You'll find it on page 103 in, the, in your front portion of Christian worship. And as been our custom, we ignore the refrain, and yet we join in the glory of pottery at the end. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. Shout for joy before the Lord the King. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. The word of our Lord continues from our second lesson today from the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. John urges us in this lesson to test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Um, those of you who were in Bible class this morning would recognize that, that this section here is really a, a lesson that mimics what Jude said to us in Bible class this morning. Um, two places. What John said... What Jude said, we also learned what Paul said as well. So this is something that is, is very prevalent in the, the Word of God, so you need to hear it and take it into account. From 1 John chapter 4, the Spirit of God can be recognized in those who acknowledge that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh. John also tells us to love one another since God loved us by sending His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God, 
and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Here ends our second lesson. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We continue with our gospel lesson for this morning in John chapter 15, verses 19, or verses 9 through 17. Uh, I was just telling uh, um, some people before church here that I had the privilege to preach on this back when I was a vicar. I haven't, haven't touched it since, and uh, um, I have the actual sermon in my files. I did look at it this week. And that's probably one of the reasons why I, I chose to preach on it this week, because I had never used it here. And um, um, But afterwards, I'm probably going to go take a look at it and see, um, see what I probably should have preached to you, uh, what was way back then. So John chapter 15, 9 through 17, here Jesus points out the connection between love and obedience, and he tells us to put our faith into action by loving each other turn our attention to nine and following. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Here ends our third lesson. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn number 380, reminding us, Lord, it is not that I didn't choose you.
shepherd who said these words to his sheep then and to you and me, his sheep in the lambs today. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. That was, those were his words from John chapter 10, verse 10 from the Good Shepherd chapter. Compliments of the Good Shepherd himself. The word of our God this morning is contained in John chapter 15, the Gospel lesson. It's the first three verses of John chapter 15. These are those words. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete thus far. In the name of and to the glory of uh, the Savior Jesus, who was willing to give us his greatest gift. That means to lay down his life for you and for me. And we weren't exactly his friends, were we? He laid down his life for his enemies, for you and for me sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is in his name I stand before you today, your fellow believers. If you spend countless hours doing something such as bowling, hunting, fishing, camping, and you know I could go on and on and on with all sorts of pastimes and recreational pursuits that you and I pursue, sometimes quotation marks religiously, odds are is that you really must enjoy doing it. Because I would venture to say that if you did not enjoy doing those things, you probably wouldn't be doing those things, right? I think that would be the case. If you didn't like the hunt, you probably wouldn't hunt. If you didn't like the garden or the camp, you probably wouldn't do those things. I think that's just human nature. We don't like doing things that we really don't like doing. The fact that these pastimes are things that people enjoy doing is the reason why they end up doing it. They like the hunt. They like the camp. They like the garden. And if you do those things, I would imagine you like to do them. That's the reason why you do them. Christianity is also a pursuit that every single one of us really needs to enjoy in order to not just be doing Christian discipline, but actually to be enjoying it as well. And because many people haven't really gotten to the point of enjoying being Christians and pursue, pursuing Christian discipline, like following God's Word, studying God's Word, learning God's Word, that's the reason why they simply aren't motivated enough to really commit themselves to the cause, to the discipline. Christianity. But this morning, you and I are going to be reminded by our Savior what we as his disciples, first of all, what we have received from him. Secondly, we're going to take a look at what you and I, because we've received from him Christ's love, what we can also reflect. I heard Pastor Tony Schultz use that same word. I said, how appropriate. I didn't even know that. He used the word reflect as well. That's, a, that's the second part of our meditation this morning. What we have received, you and I have the privilege and the opportunity to reflect. And then we're going to take a look at the blessing that you and I have because we've received the love of Christ. We can reflect 
Christ's love in our life, and you and I have the promise from Savior Himself that it will give you and me great joy and happiness. So, receive, reflect, and rejoice. Perhaps at this time I might want to explain why, why I don't have the computer up here and I don't have control of the, of the TV screens. Uh, I was not, not ready to have uh, our LED screen people here today, so uh, it wouldn't have gotten done, so I didn't do one, and, and uh, that's the reason why you don't have it up there. But you have the most important part, and hopefully you will see the verses, verses 9, 10, 11, uh, throughout the meditation. His word is really the most important part of it. Words before us this morning are words that Jesus spoke to his disciples in the upper room on Monday Thursday evening, just hours before he was going to lay down his life, not just for his disciples, for his friends, but also for enemies, for sinners, for all mankind. Yes, hours before Good Friday when he would give his life on the cross. The words that Jesus spoke in John chapter 15 here were really intended for the assurance and the comfort of his disciples who were going to be put through the rigor in the next day or so. But these words were intended for so much more than just assurance and comfort right now. These words would become encouragement and motivation for his disciples in the long run, way long time after he ascended in heaven during their ministries for him. After he reminded the disciples to stay connected to him as branches are connected to the vine, sort of like uh, the kids' connection, stay connected to Jesus. That's really the theme of the first, first eight verses of John, isn't it? How you and I can stay connected to Jesus. After reminding them of being like branches connected to the vine, staying connected, staying alive and green, which was the, the theme of my one of my first sermons that I ever preached way back in 1980. Uh, I read the thought of going back and taking a look at that and seeing how much, how much better those sermons were back then than they are today. But he told them to stay alive and green on the vine, like branches stay connected to the vine. And then he reminded them of his, of his great love for them. He said this, verse 9, it says, as my Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Really not, but I didn't tell we should have split it up. So, here Jesus reminds his disciples that he had for them the highest form of love that there is. The best kind of love that you can love another person. This is the same kind of love that the Lord says, God so loved the world. Yes, this is a, a unselfish, sacrificial, unlimited kind of love that is the love on the basis of the giver and not the one who is loved. Well, Jesus says that he loved them just like his Father had loved me. It was a perfect divine love that Jesus had for his disciples. And Jesus showed them that love, not only by telling them by word of mouth, yes, I love you, but even more so, he showed them, he demonstrated, he proved for them his love by doing what he did. By his actions, especially of sacrificing his life on Calvary's cross. That really nailed it down for the disciples and proved to them that Jesus truly did love them with the highest and best form of love that you can. In fact, verse 13, Jesus says, you heard it in the word before us, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus showed them that love. I love you. I didn't just tell you, but I showed you how much I love you. Jesus loved them, and he certainly wanted to keep on loving them, right? And that's why he said the next words of the same verse. He said, 
As my Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Stay in my love. Continue to be in my love. Yeah, that's not exactly an option there. That's, that's, that's General Jesus talking to the private disciples. And yeah, this really is not an option. This is what you need to do. And evidently, it's not something that happens automatically. That comes out of the clear blue. Oh, I'm going to stay and remain in Jesus' love no matter what I do. That's not going to happen. It's not involuntary like some of the things that, that you have in your body. They do it without even thinking about it, right? Just imagine what your life would be if you had to think about your heart beating every second. <laughs> we wouldn't be here, wouldn't we? Because there's times we wouldn't be thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, what? It would stop, right? Well, staying connected to Jesus, remaining in the vine is not, is not involuntary. It's not, it's not something that happens automatically. And what did Jesus get done, just get done talking to his disciples about? Staying connected to him. Staying connected to him like being a branch connected to the vine. Don't disconnect yourself from me, the vine. Don't separate yourself. Don't, don't sever yourself from a relationship with me and my word. Because if you do, you're not going to remain in me and you're not going to remain in my love. And so he told them not just to remain in his love, but he told them how to remain in his love. A little bit different way than he did in the first eight verses of this chapter. He said this in verse, in verse 10. There. I didn't even have to do it. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in his love. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like tit for tat, doesn't it? Sounds like Pavlov's dog. Yep, you do this and that, that will happen. And to a degree, the conclusion of commandments remind us that he will reward you for keeping his commandments. He promises you grace. What? Yes, he has undeserved love and every blessing. But there's more to it than that. He just got done telling us about how a branch remains the vine. How you and I as disciples remain green and living by staying connected to him. And how do you and I stay connected? By having his words in us. Contact with his words. Contact with Jesus' words. And he's going to say, he's going to say that in this in the Monday, Monday Thursday upper, upper room message. Staying connected to me means keeping your nose and your eyes and your ears in my word. Constant, continuous contact with my word. And then what's going to happen? The Holy Spirit is going to bless you with blessings called the blessing of faith. Faith comes from hearing the message, right? Yes, faith is going to come. And guess what else comes through the means of grace? Yes, the means of grace is the means by which God gets his grace into us. His undeserved love. Christ's love comes to us. So if you are staying connected to Jesus by staying in his word, connected to his word, keep your nose in his word, well then then you're going to continue to have faith. And faith in Jesus, you're going to continue to have the love of Christ in you. And guess what? You're going to have the ability, you're going to have the power, you're going to have the motivation to be able to do anything you want. But the thing you're going to be able to want to do is, is what he said here, to obey my commands. Somebody that is not staying connected to Jesus will not have the faith in Jesus, will not have Christ's love in them to do that very thing. And so Jesus was telling them, if you obey my commands, that is, if you stay connected to me and my word, and my word is in you, and therefore the Holy Spirit gets his faith in, into you, and Christ's love into you, and then you're going to be able to do my commands. And guess what? You're going to be showing yourself to be my disciples. You're going to be in my love, and you're going to have faith in me. Jesus tells the disciples that if they stay continued, 
connected to him, that they would be recipients of faith in him and his love. His love would come to them, and that would make them love him back and want to do all of these things like hearing his word, studying his word, memorizing his word, putting his word to practice, sharing his word. Yes, all those things, they will be glad to do that. In fact, it was the Apostle, the Apostle Paul who wrote 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The good news of Jesus' sacrifice, his dying for all, is the good news that, that gives people faith in him. And it also is the means by which he gets his love into you and to me. The very love that you and I need to love our Savior back and be able to live for him Love Him, serve Him, obey His commandments. That's the reason why you and I do. Is because we have faith in Jesus and the love of Christ is in us. Being recipients of Christ's love. And having the opportunity to reflect that love in our life back to Him by saying, Lord, I love you. This is the way I'm showing it by obeying your commands. Would result in more than just doing the right things that you and I do as Christians today. Savior Jesus tells us that there's going to be a, re a bigger blessing than just you and me living and serving and reflecting Christ's love in our life, being His lights. You and I are going to have a bigger blessing, a bigger reward than that. He tells us what that reward is in verse 11. He says, I told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. It was the Savior himself who didn't want his disciples just doing what they were going to do for him, just to do it. Jesus wanted them to be doing what they were going to do for him, not just because it was the right thing to do, but because they really wanted to be doing it for him. You know, Jesus wanted his disciples to have the exact, identical, same feeling that he had, Jesus had, when he was perfectly and obediently following his Father's will. Jesus enjoyed. It great, gave him great satisfaction. And it made him happy that he had the privilege to be able to show how much he loved his Heavenly Father by doing what he did. He didn't do it just to do it. He didn't do it because there was a hefty whip behind him. Crack! The whip! I'm going to be in trouble if I know. He didn't do it because he needed to do it. Nobody else to do it. He did it because he wanted to do it. And he was rejoicing in doing that. Not that not that what he did was made him happy. It was, it was grueling. It was gruesome. You've been through Lent. What he went through for you and for me wasn't pretty. But he willingly and he cheerfully did what he did. Not just to benefit you and bless you and me and to save you and me from sin, death, and death, but he did it willingly for his Heavenly Father. And Jesus wanted his disciples to have that same feeling to say, have that same joy that he had in doing that for him. In fact, it gave Jesus much joy, not just to willingly obey his Heavenly Father, but to hear those words from his Heavenly Father himself when he said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus loved his disciples so much that he looked at what he was willing to do. And he tells us in verse 13, he was willing to go the extra mile, wasn't he? Really, the extra mile when he says, Greater love has no one than this, and that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus loved them so much that he was willing to die to redeem them. Now he wanted them to love him, not just, not just to, to do what they were going to do as a, as a, as a uh, response or a gratefulness. 
But he, even more, he wanted them to have the ultimate, ultimate joy of living, serving, and loving him same way that he had loved his Heavenly Father. You and I have been given the gift of faith. You and I have received the gift of faith through the, the gospel and word and sacrament. You and I, along with that faith in Jesus Christ, have been also given the gift of the love of Christ. We call that gospel love. That gospel love can make you and me do anything, everything that we normally could do without it. Faith and love. Faith in Christ, the love of Christ. It enables us to love Him back. It enables us to reflect that love for Him uh, back to Him and show Him that we love Him, uh, love Him for what He has done for us. But it is this love of Christ that makes us go one step further. And that's the step further that Jesus is talking about here in verse 11 here. Blessings of Christ's love for us compels us not to just do what you and I do to reflect the light of, of God's grace to others as lights of the world, but it leads you and me to go that one step further and do what we do because, well... It's not just the right thing to do, but because we love to be doing what we are doing for our Savior Jesus. Just as Jesus enjoyed showing his love to his Heavenly Father by obeying his commands, so also he wants us to be enjoying what we do, showing our love to our Savior Jesus by following his will and commands. And there is the question that you and I have for us today question that you need to answer for yourself, the, the question that you need to answer as you go home today and look at this Word of God, and that answer is this. Is this what Christianity is to you? Is Christianity the opportunity to show your joy to Jesus for His love and blessings to you? Do you enjoy the privilege of being able to be his Christian disciples and doing what disciples do? Getting your nose in his word, studying his word, learning more of his word today than you did yesterday and more tomorrow than you did today. Do you enjoy doing that? So much so that it becomes a pursuit that you continue, just like a hobby or a recreational pursuit. Something that you pursue just as much as hunting, fishing, camping, gardening. Is that what Christianity is to you? Something that you enjoy so much that you, you really, really love to be doing it? So much so that you do it? Is Christianity the opportunity to reflect what you and I have been given, the faith and the love of Christ that we've been given, the blessings that we have because of it? Christianity the opportunity to give us joy by being lights to others? Not because it's the right thing to do, not because we're lights, but because we really, really enjoy doing it. Is that what Christianity is for you and for me? Sad to say, I think a lot of times, for every one of us, that's not the case. I would have to admit, and I'm sure that you would too, there's a lot of times that you and I, what we do as Christians, is because, well, if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. It's a sad motivation. Or what we do is because we need to do it. Because people need us to do it. That's not the right motivation either. Have to? Need to? Do we want to? Do we do these things because we really, really enjoy doing them? And that even goes beyond a lot to, isn't it? It's Christ's love that not only makes us come out with, but makes us want to and are rejoicing that we have the opportunity to do that. You've heard this before from me, and you probably hear it again. It has been said that many Christians today um, do not get enough of the religion or the word to make them feel joyful. They get only enough to make them feel guilty. Would that be you? Do you only get enough of the Word of God to 
to make you feel guilty? You only get enough of the Word of God to make you want to do what you have to do. Do you only get enough of the Word of God to make you remember that you need to do it because nobody else is going to do it? Or are you getting enough of the Word of God to really make you enjoy pursuing the Christian discipline and enjoy living for Christ? And before that, before living for Him, you've got to learn what He wants you to do and how to live. I asked Pastor Gary Grant this past Tuesday at, at Pastor's Conference, and he doesn't know I'm using him this morning. It's like my wife doesn't usually know either when I use her as an example, but I'm going to pick on Pastor Grant. Pastor, I asked Pastor Grant when he was finally going to retire, and he's, he's of the age that he could have retired. He could have retired some time ago. But he's still in the ministry. He's still continuing to be the pastor of St. John's Battle Creek. And for the present time, he's the vacancy pastor down in Portage, St. James. And I asked him when he was finally going to retire. And you know what he said? I was not ready for the answer. He said, I'm not ready to retire now. Because I'm still enjoying what I'm doing. Are you enjoying what you're doing for the Savior as Christians? That's something only you can answer. I'm not talking about having to do it, needing to do it, even wanting to do it. But one step about that. Are you really, really enjoying the joy of Christ? Living, serving, loving your Savior and others. Something that I have to answer for myself and you do too. What each of us does for extracurricular activities, hobbies, recreational pursuits, obviously you have to enjoy. You know, that's, that's what I'm facing right now. Do I really enjoy gardening that much that I'm going to do all that work of putting in seeds and watering it and and cultivating it, and, and weeding it, and all that stuff. Do I really enjoy gardening that much? Do I really want to put those seeds in the soil this week? I didn't do it last week. I didn't do it the week before. Because I'm trying to answer that question for myself. Do I really want to do it? Do I enjoy gardening that much that I'm willing to pursue all that work? Why can't I just go down and buy this bio? That is the question I have to answer for myself and for my family. And time is going to tell whether there's something that sprouts in there that are weeds or whether they're beans and radishes and all sorts of stuff. I have to answer that question for myself. That's the same question that you and I have to answer for ourselves as well. You and I know that we've been made recipients of, of faith in Christ and, and love of Christ. And that gives us the power the, and the ability to reflect back that love of Christ by loving Him and others. Also motivates us too, but I'm talking about what I need to pray for myself and what I need to pray for you is that the Holy Spirit would even more so lead you and me to be His disciples and pursue Christian discipline that you and I know of living, loving, and serving our Savior, not just because we have to, not because we need to, or even because we want to, but because the Holy Spirit has given to you and me the joy that Christ had, the joy that Jesus wants you and me to have, to follow and serve Him. We continue with our confession of faith, uh, the Apostles' Creed. Let's arise and confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with today's prayer of the church, followed by some intercessory prayers as well. O oh, Jesus Christ, crucified and risen Savior, accept our offering of thanks and praise today. How great was your devotion to the task of our redemption. How totally unselfish was the sacrifice you made on our behalf. Our sins brought you pain, suffering, and death. But you brought us life and salvation. The debt we owed, a holy and just God, you paid in full with your sacrifice on the cross. You exchanged your righteousness for our sins so that we could stand before our God unashamed and fully accepted. In your glorious resurrection, we now find a certain hope of our own resurrection. And now, O Christ, your intercession to God on our behalf gives each of us courage and boldness to pray with confidence that our prayers are truly answered. Through the Holy Spirit, teach each of us to call upon your name without ceasing. Teach us what good things we need to pray for. May unbelief and doubt never keep us from praying and, or prevent our prayers from being heard or answered. Give us faith to believe that God accepts our prayers for the sake of your precious blood shed for us. Help us to pray with contrite hearts and make humble confession of our sins. Come with your divine blessings, Redeemer, that all who believe in you may, in your blessings, find complete satisfaction and joy. O oh, Savior, grant that our love for you may never be replaced by a lust for the things of this world. Keep us from yielding to soul-destroying sins. May the Holy Spirit keep us from trusting in anyone or anything to save us besides your merit and sacrifice. Help us always to walk in the Spirit that led by Him we may follow your pure example and thereby joyfully testify and witness to the source of our faith and love. Forgive every occasion when we fail to trust in you, to love you, to keep you in our thoughts, to serve you joyfully, or to continue your word, to be praying to you unceasingly, to praise you, or even to witness to you, sharing your word to others. Cover us with your blood-bought righteousness. How it comforts us to know that you are our ever-living King who reigns supreme, hearing and answering all of our prayers and causing all good things to work out for our good. Yes, even those things that frighten and push us. All praise to your holy name in heaven and earth. O Savior, precious Jesus. Amen. We also join in a prayer of intercession on behalf of our moms on this Mother's Day. Dearest Lord, we thank you for the gift of life that you granted us through our, through our moms. We also thank you for the time and love that she's, she has given us during our lives. We pray that you will bless mothers everywhere with the love, patience, understanding, and strength to carry out their special work. And we especially pray that they carry out your Christian will and lead, lead as Eunice and Lois uh, did to Timothy, leading their children to you as Savior. Lead ev children everywhere to be thankful for their moms, and even more so for Christian moms. Keep families everywhere faithful to your word. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We also join in praying an intercessory prayer on behalf of Jim Marie. Heavenly Father, Divine Physician, you have promised that you will be with us always, wherever we go. Your promise to be with us is a blessing of your ascension. Lord, there are times today when there can't be anything, anyone with us, especially because of the ongoing pandemic restrictions. Comfort us that we are never alone, because you are always with us. Dear Savior, you gave our brother in Christ a, a little lesson on life this past week. 
you gave Jim a reason to, for him to be hospitalized. Seriously. Lord, even though we can't be with him, and even though the only people around him are hospital personnel, remind him that you are with him and that you will continue to be with him until, Lord willing, you allow him to make his way home again. Heavenly Father, we command him into your loving and gracious hands, as we do with us all. We pray this in the name of our, our Savior and Good Shepherd, who gave his life for each and every one of us as his sheep and lambs. We also continue using his model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Go in peace, live in harmony with each other, but above, above all, serve your Lord with joy, joy, and gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you that joy. Good morning. Good morning. One of the reasons why I like to have kids connection is because it just exudes so much joy that the people have there in doing what they do. And, and Pastor Tony Schultz is a good example of that. And you know, that was one of my prayers this morning. Lord, forgive me for all the times that I haven't shown that joy. So, he forgives me. And you got to too. So, again, Ascension Worship is coming this Thursday. A privilege we have to be able to remember, be reminded of what the Lord did for us on the 40th day after Easter. And he ascended to heaven to benefit you and me. He's up there to minister to you and me. And that's one of the things that we will remember this coming Thursday, the 40th day after Easter. So, again, um, it's not very popular of a service. In fact, most churches today have simply done, it, done away with it because um, it's just so sparsely attended. Um, again, we have the privilege to be able to remember the ascension of our Lord. And we'll do that <laughs> on Thursday at 7.30. The spring cleaning week duty list is up on the board. First come, first serve. You'll see that most of the duties are the same things that have been in the past. Um, I did add one that, I, um, that I'm going to take myself. So again, if you have other duties that need to be added, there, um, feel free to do that this year, and then I can add it to the list next year. So, and um, church councilmen, we have a meeting immediately following today. And uh, I pray that your work this week for your Savior as light of the world isn't just because you are a light of the world, but because you don't just have to be the light of the world or need to be the light of the world or want to be the light of the world, but because Jesus joys in you. And that's why you're going to be a light to the world around you. Have a good week. Blessings to you all. We'll begin with... Uh, Andy in the back, in the back there. Um, you got stuff here.